Hello and welcome to the Leathercraft Masterclass. And in this episode, I've taken some followers questions from Instagram stories about all the questions, the burning questions they have to do with Leathercraft. So I'm also recording this on the main camera, which you're watching from now. And I'm gonna be doing an Instagram live as well in a moment. So we can take some live questions if we have time. But the questions I've collected I have here and I'll be making my way through them. Now, just to let you know, if you don't have time to watch this, because it might be quite a long video, I'm gonna be doing a version for the podcast as well. So I'm gonna be ripping the audio after editing this and I'll put it up as a podcast as well. So you can download that, leathercraftmasterclass.com, go into the main menu, click podcasts, and you'll be able to download this and go to the gym, do your gardening, do some craft work, whatever you like. So there'll be an audio as well. Many other episodes too to check out absolutely free. So before we start answering some of these questions, let's go live. So let's go over to the phone and go live. Checking connection, you are now live. Okay, so now we can uh, potentially interact with some people as well. Okay, so these questions here that I have ripped from Instagram stories. Now, I think I had 120 something uh, questions come through, so I can't go through all of them, obviously, because we don't have time. Hello again, <laughs> how's it going? All right, so I'm gonna go straight in uh, with the first question. Now, I can't say who asked the questions because I didn't actually ask permission. Maybe I'll do that next time, but it's uh, anonymous, so I won't say who's asked. Good evening once again. <laughs> yes. Bodega Brazil says, cute hair, mate. Oh, thank you very much. I'm glad you <laughs> think my hair is cute. Right, so let's go on with some of the questions. Now, there's a few questions here. I've tried to get them as, as kind of dissimilar as possible, but a lot of these were repeats, as in I saw a lot of these questions. Um, and if a lot of people ask them, then there's probably a lot of other people that want to know the answers to them as well. So question number one, let's dive straight in. Question number one is, why is my edge paint peeling off? Good question. Because um, a lot of people have issues with edge paint who come from like a burnishing mindset into edge paint because I've seen many, many times people try to smooth an edge by burnishing first and then applying edge paint. Uh, I've also seen people applying wax to an edge and then applying edge paint and then trying to burn it in and all sorts of things like that. Edge paint needs what you would do to a wall before painting it, like any other paint. You would sand it, you'd rough it up so that it has the best possible chance of adhesion. Now, if you have a very, very smooth edge on your leather, then unfortunately that can uh, play havoc with the paint's ability to soak into and bond with the leather, which is what it needs to do. It doesn't want to sit on top so much as soak in very slightly so it can anchor itself into the edge. So sometimes, even though it's much easier to apply edge paint on a really beautifully clean, fresh cut with a sharp scalpel-like blade, apply edge paint onto that, sometimes it would be, it can be good just to get a piece of sandpaper or a piece of sandpaper glued to a bit of board and just in one direction, just a few swipes, we're not changing how the edge is profiled or anything like that, it's still smooth, but it just opens up the grain a little bit more, allowing you to work that edge paint in and then that edge paint can anchor itself. Another thing that leads to edge paint peeling off is going to be applying too many layers. So say for instance, you know, you're applying eight layers, 10 layers, 12 layers, because you, you know, you're really trying to get that smooth edge and each and every time it's not smooth enough. So you just a touch of more sanding and another paint trying to get that perfect edge. And you end up building up more and more and more th layers until you've got a thick piece of synthetic rubber-like material on the top. That's gonna to be much easier to peel off. The least easiest layer to peel off is layer number one, as always, directly onto the leather, it's anchored itself in. The more layers you start adding, the more likelihood of peeling off, especially where you're seeing a lot of flex in the leather. Um, and that, that's where edge paint really does get its um, bad reputation, especially from people who are more used to burnishing. 
Um, it's all about edge preparation, edge preparation, edge preparation. The perfect edge for edge paint is clean cut, very slightly rough, but still smooth. That's a good foundation to start with. Now, another thing can be the type of leather that you're uh, using. Vegetable tanned leather um, that contains high amounts of oils or waxes is one of the most difficult to apply edge paint to. And that's where primers can come in handy. I do find a lot of primers, however, can be quite thick. Um, and it's, it's, it can be an, there can be an issue with your edge paint peeling off the primer. Um, that sometimes happens as well. So, you know, some primers are good, some primers are not. There's some paints that you have to have a primer style. I think I've had bad results with peeling from that. Um, but apparently you're, you're meant to use a, a primer on that one. So I'd, I'd recommend testing on leather first. Um, heavily waxed, heavily oiled leathers also uh, bring a problem. So a question here from Pinatel and how do you prevent the paint from cracking on folds? If you apply it folded, when you open the wallet, it cracks sometimes. I think cracking on, on folds can also be, it's more likely to happen when it's thick. It's more likely to happen when you've got more layers added on there then the paint is more likely to resist uh, folding. It's a little bit like, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to fold tin foil back and forth several times. You could be there for hours doing it, nothing's gonna happen. But if you get a thick piece of aluminium, bend it forwards, bend it back, bend it for two or three times, it'll snap in half, you'll crack. It's the, the, the thicker it is, the more likely it is to happen. So if it takes you many, many, many layers for you to get a good edge finish, it might be worth practicing so that you can get just maybe two to three layers before it's you know, perfect. So it needs a bit more practice because the thicker it is, the more likely it is to bend. Now, if it's a bend that takes a lot of folding, like a bifold wallet, for example, um, that, that can be a challenge. If your edges are thick, that's another thing. So when I mean thickness, the width of your edge, if you've got three millimeters and you apply edge paint to it, whether it's closed, whether it's open, that after a while is just gonna crack. If you have a thin edge, that's where it's less likely to crack. Uh, do I have, no, I don't think I have my wallet here. No, it's not, it's probably at home. But anyway, a thinner, a thinner edge, so the thickness of your leather, the thinner it is, the less likely, likely it is to crack as well. Another issue for cracking can be people that tend to use um, uh, an edge creasing machine with a spatula or just a, a regular single crease to, to heat the edge paint itself. Now the issue with that can be uh, sometimes the heat can degrade the integrity of the edge paint itself. So it doesn't like, you know, when, when you see people drawing it along the top of their edge paint and there's smoke billowing off and all that kind of thing, it's too much heat. It's not designed to take that, that amount of heat. The only time you should add heat is when it's just been freshly sanded on your finished layer and you just, just enough heat to smooth it and that's it. Don't keep going over it and over it and allowing heat to build up inside the edge paint that can degrade it and lead to a loss in flexibility, more likely to crack, peel off, etc. cetera. Uh, Wished in Leather says, awesome analogy, thank you. Got it, thanks a lot. I do not heat my paint, cracks completely, yeah. Uh, too, much, too much heat is, is um, uh, using heat is, a, is, a, is difficult because it's very easy to use too much heat and it takes kind of an experienced hand to know what is too hot. And that's also going to vary um, from edge paint brand to edge paint brand. For example, Giardini, just I've never had great luck using heat to smooth those edges. Some people have, but I find it, it's, it's so close to burning before it actually does anything that it's very easy to go over, over the edge. Uh, Alenzi Leatherwork says, uh, depends on the paint brand, Giardini, I <laughs> just said that, Giardini is more flexible, more rubbery. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I use, Giardini is good, but yeah, you're right on the, it has that kind of rubbery feel. And I have used it in the past, and I have had clients mention it. What's this rubbery feel on the edge? And it's not in a, in a bad way, it's just something that they did notice. 
And to be honest, you know, clients don't always notice a lot. They don't look at the angles and go, wow, you managed to get the angles on the rear side as well. No clients ever, ever said that to me. They talk more about the, the design, the feel of the leather, the smell of it and all that kind of thing. But, but I have had one or two clients mention, what is this stuff on the side? Is this rubber? And it's probably not what I want to hear, to be, <laughs> to be honest, especially if you've used some nice exotic leather. So I've, I've never had that ever since. So you uh, switched to um, Uniter's, Uniter's Edge Paint. Whereas Uniter's seems a tougher, stiffer surface. Yeah, so it's a little bit more smooth. When you feel it, it doesn't feel as tacky on the finger. Right, okay. So let's get into question number two. So how long have we been? My big camera says I've been 11 minutes in. Okay, so we've got an hour on this, uh, on this live. Now I actually have a skiving knife here um, because the next question is the art of skiving, please. Uh, there's no question mark. There's an exclamation mark at the end of that, but <laughs> it still comes under a question. The art of skiving. The art of skiving. Skiving to a lot of people seems... Uh, such voodoo that I think there's many, many people out there who don't explore more fine leather craft because they don't have the skill to skive well. And I think that this, this is another analogy that I like to use for skiving, okay? People who try skiving and aren't good at it, 99% of the time it's because the blade isn't sharp enough. I've actually freshly sharpened a blade before given it to someone who's never skived, didn't know what the word skiving was, and I said, do this, and I pushed the blade along the edge uh, and showed you know, what it looked like. And that person, completely ignorant to what skiving actually is, looked at it, saw that it looked quite easy, grabbed the blade and did it themselves, and it wasn't quite as good as mine, as you'd probably imagine, because they've never skived before or know what it was, but they thought it was terrible. I'll tell you what, it wasn't that bad at all. And they just did the same thing. They just held it at an angle, pushed it forward. They started to over skive quite quickly, but it was, they, they, didn't, they weren't aware of how difficult it normally is, if you know what I mean. Ignorance is bliss sometimes. A lot of people put skiving up on a pedestal, but it really does come down to how sharp the blade is. Now, if I gave a semi-sharp blade to someone who's never skived before, they're probably just gonna slice through the leather all themselves. Um, but the analogy that I like to use is a bit like going on a surfboard, trying to surf whilst learning how to juggle. Then when you fail at it, you think, I'm just not good at juggling. That's what it is. I'm not good at juggling. No, you're standing on a surfboard. You haven't got the right platform in which to learn how to juggle. And that is skiving knives. If you're not able to get a knife, skiving, skiving, razor sharp, it's not, you're not, gonna be, it doesn't mean that you're not good at skiving, it just means the blade's not sharp. You haven't got the right tool, the right platform to learn how to do it correctly, if you know what I mean. I hope you understand the analogy, but most people can't skive, not because they can't skive, because they don't know how to sharpen correctly. Um, now, I'll plug my own courses, uh, Techniques of the Blade, that's a course where I teach how to sharpen and how to skive, but you'll notice for people who've watched that video course, I talk about how to sharpen first, not afterwards, because the most important thing is getting that razor, razor edge. Then you can learn how to sharpen. So you need the right platform force, uh, platform first, which is a super sharp blade. Hammerhead uh, Leather says, absolutely agree with you on the sharp blade. The edge can go off so quickly. Uh, it feels sharp, but it isn't sharp enough. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've spoken to people before, been to their workshops when they say, uh, oh yeah, I know how to sharpen my, my all blades. They're super sharp, they're super sharp, feel that, super sharp. I push it through leather and it, f and it feels like I'm just like trying to stab a brick wall. I think what some people regard as sharp isn't sharp at all. Like when I draw this across the hairs, they should ping forwards. And that doesn't mean they come off as I do it. They sh literally shoot forwards that's a sign that you've got a razor, razor edge. That makes skiving easy, literally makes skiving easy. I can take someone off the street, give them 30 minutes of tuition, and they'll be reasonably, reasonably good on a specific type of leather. If I throw in different leathers and variables, they wouldn't know how to do that, but I can get someone very, very quickly 
up to a decent level as long as that blade is sharp. That is where the skill is. You know, it's always important to learn how to sharpen first because that's such an important life skill in many different craft areas. You know, it could be carpentry, it could be leather craft, it could be so many different things. Cool, right, so next question. So how to define good quality vegetable tan leather is our third question today. So how do we uh, find out? Now, as it happens, I do have a free course that's gonna be coming to you guys through my website, which is specifically about selecting high quality leather, what to look out for, tannery tricks, um, how to test leather before you even purchase it so that you can decide whether it's good or not before you, you know, disconnect any dollars. Um, so that is going to be coming soon. Ideally in the next few weeks, it's been, uh, it's been a, a long process, but there's a few changes coming. So that's going to be coming out. In the meantime, how do I define good quality leather? Quality is subjective. I think, um, you know, terrible, terrible leather is going to be good for nothing, but there's some types of leather that might on the surface not seem particularly good quality, but they work very, very well for a specific type of product. Like I could take certain types of leather that have been processed to make flooring out of, and it feels like wood. And if someone's to make a bag out of that, you know, even with the sharpest blade, it's really difficult to get your all blade in there. They're difficult to punch, difficult to do anything on because it's designed for flooring, floor tiles, leather floor tiles, literally leather floors. Uh, personally, I like to use them for making boxes because then you get to use leather and it's almost like wood, if you know what I mean. But it's difficult, usually oak bark tanned. But if I gave that to someone and said, go and make a bag out of that or a briefcase, they would tell me that that was poor quality leather. There was something wrong with it. So uh, it's very subjective. Poor quality leather to me is leather that's really dry, uh, cracks very, very easily. Leather that is overly heat sensitive. So if you want to use a, a heated edge creaser, it burns very easily. Um, I've had ones that it burns or it's not quite hot enough to make a proper crease. I've had that before. Uh, leather that, um, what you said specifically vegetable tan leather, vegetable tan leather that is fully pigmented on its surface. I don't think that's, that's very good. To me, that's like getting a, you know, a, a beautiful piece of walnut and then just painting it uh, rather than staining it. So I think lower quality leather is usually fully pigmented so that you don't see any blemishes on there. Um, and then it's, it's, it comes down to specific types of leather for specific projects. And that's a huge, makes a huge difference matching the right leather to the right project. So, you know, bad quality leather is not as easy to get hold of anymore because it doesn't sell well after a while. There are some places in London that I've been that, that, that do have um, leather that's not particularly great, but most of the time when you're, when you're buying online nowadays, you know, everyone's scrambling to get leather from the top tanneries and leather that everyone's going crazy for and that kind of thing. So I think we're really better off now than we ever have been with leather selection. So it's not as easy to, to buy poor quality leather in the first place. Uh, I think we're quite spoiled to be honest, so I'm very grateful for that. Right, so um, to recap on that question, how to define good quality veg tan leather, I've mentioned a few things there, but I do have a free video, uh, 38 minutes long, that's gonna be coming to the website soon. And that's going to show you in detail what to look out for. But uh, as a kind of a tip, it comes down to how does it work? Okay, so when you work it, when you stitch it, when you skive it, uh, when you edge crease it, when you do a folded edge, when you do a burnish, all these kind of things. When I get samples through, the first thing I do is perform like a, a whole array of tests on it. And then once I'm happy, it works excellently and it's the right leather for the right project. And I like the look and I like the feel of it, then it's the right leather for me. And then I give it the label of, you know, the stamp, that's good quality. That's something I'm gonna keep on my list as a, a go-to leather for that kind of project. So it comes down to testing, a lot of testing. Uh, fourth question. 
Oh, sorry, the, because my camera, so, uh, my uh, phone is so far away, I'm really struggling to see uh, our scenario. I hope I said that right. Quality is subjective. Yes, absolutely. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Best Spoke WH says, Thread, yes, I'll be getting there. Uh, Austin J. Nixon says, hey there, friend. Hey, Austin, how you going? Uh, question number, where are we? Number four. This is an interesting one. Um, some of you will be interested, some, maybe some of you won't. This is more of a, like a business question. How can one man or woman, uh, <laughs> how can a one man business optimize efficiency to scale up and grow and stop being a side project? That's an interesting one. But the very fact that you threw in, you know, optimizing business efficiency, scaling up, um, tells me that you're probably familiar with a little bit of business or you've looked into it. So you're already uh, a leg up uh, from people who say, how can you make money from this? Uh, it's, it's not as difficult as people think, but people always think that it's all about just the leather craft. I'm going to make what I want to make and then I'm going to take pictures. I'm going to put them on the internet for people to see and I'll be able to uh, flip the bird to my boss in a week. It doesn't happen like that. Uh, it comes down to understanding that what you want to do as a choice comes last. What people actually want comes first. So it's a deep dive into the world of speaking to potential customers, going on forums for people who appreciate the finer things in life and seeing what your ideal customer looks like, sounds like, quacks like, understanding them and then building an idea of who you're marketing towards, who you're talking to, and uh, really understanding who your potential customers could be and where they are and where their attention is going and how you can somehow get what you do in your brand where their attention is and explain to them very simply why you're good, why you're better, or what you have to offer that's unique. Then you can start thinking about designing products, building a business. Um, but what a lot of people do is take the thing that they should be doing last, which is designing the products, and they do that as the first thing, was the first thing is understanding the end user and then working back to creating products. You know, um, some are, you know, but I, and I've said this before, I think wallets and card holders are great. We've got a few more years with them. I, other than keeping a card holder in my car, I can't remember the last time I used the card. I use my phone for everything. When I go in to buy expensive things or cheap things at the supermarket, I'm tapping my phone. If I'm buying online, I'm on my phone or on my laptop. I think... You know, card holders and wallets are great, but a lot of people are really holding on to tech that's going to be obsolete as a way of creating leather goods. So I think a lot of people should be looking to the future now and going, what's the new tech coming out? What are people using more? I mean, there's, there's some places, you know, like France, for example, and there's a few other countries that still use coin pouches. I'd, if I needed spare coins right now, I'd probably go looking underneath, you know, the car mats or something. In my car. I wouldn't know where to get it. I never use cash for, for anything. Um, so I, I think we really need to be looking as a leather craft community towards the future a little bit more. What are people beginning to use? What's trending? What's coming out? What gadgets are coming out that are going absolutely wild that people could be using leather work items for? You know, like with people that got on to the, who got on early into creating watch straps for the, the, um, the Apple Watch. Is it Apple Watch? I can't remember what it's called. Basically that um, did very well. People that got on to uh, creating a little shell for the AirPods, they did very well. Um, people, you know, looking towards tech as a way to, for creating leather goods, because there's a lot of things that are going obsolete now, and I think we should all be looking towards the future a little bit more. But that's my personal opinion. So how can one man business optimize efficiently to scale up and grow, to stop being a side project? Personally, um, I went a very long time trying to leave the day job, going back a few years now, 
uh, many years, uh, <laughs> trying to leave my day job to go full time as a leather craftsman. I, I said to myself, okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna keep going. And eventually when I earn more money from leather craft, I'm gonna quit my job and go full time in leather craft. That just never happened. I waited the longest time, I did everything I could. But if you're doing a part time job as a leather craftsman and a full time job as a, an accountant, you're only ever getting part time results. So you're asking your part time leather crafting job to give you full time results so that you know when to switch. It's not gonna happen, it doesn't make sense. And when I say it like that, it's obvious, but you know, to me, it was like, okay, this is. I've got to do something here. So uh, I took some major time off work um, and put my time all into the business seven days a week. And I tell you what, when you're thrown in the deep end, you tend to move quickly uh, because you need to survive. And that is something that I underestimated because I ended up making more money in my first month as a leather craftsman than my full-time job plus the side hustle. Because when you're working seven days a week and all you're doing is being consumed by uh, leather work, then you tend to push yourself much, much harder than you ordinarily would anywhere else. And, you know, it's, it's a great feeling. It really is. And I encourage, you know, anybody who has an entrepreneurial spirit to try it at some point in their lives because you just occasionally you have to have that kind of you got to take a leap of faith. You've got to take a bit of risk in your life, but manage risk. Everyone says, you know, you need to have at least six months of, of cash before you go full, you know, quit your job and go full time into whatever business you want to go in. Actually, I, I disagree. I think one year, one year is a much better buffer so that if you are out of work and you, you know, your idea wasn't working, you've got a year's savings to back you up uh, in case anything goes wrong. But there is a little bit of, uh, of risk involved in anything like that. So, do, 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 do. okay, let's move on to the next question, which is your opinion on laser cutters. Laser cutters. <sighs> I mean, you're asking someone who's kind of passionately obsessed with traditional techniques, old school ideas and skills, uh, what they think of laser cutters. So you're gonna get a bit of a biased uh, answer to this. Would I ever use a laser cutter Probably not. Have I used one? De you know, I, I haven't. Um, you know, any any time that you really put a machine between you and your work, there's more of a disconnect, I find. And the more disconnected you are from your work, the more it can suffer. If your goal is to create the finest leather work with the most attention to detail and craftsmanship possible, if you have a passion for craftsmanship, you always want to be as close to the leather, literally hands on the leather as much as possible. And when you put, you know, sewing machines, cutting machines, laser machines between you and that, you start to build the disconnect. Now, it's, that doesn't mean I'm right. It doesn't mean I'm right at all. Uh, that can be completely wrong, but it's my opinion. And personally, every, any time that I use a machine, you know, like in carpentry, I used to be a carpenter. I was a trained carpenter for when I was younger. I went to college and studied it. And I much preferred, you know, using chisels versus a router or um, using, uh, you know, sanded by hand versus using a hand sander. It's much more efficient. You're going to get more work done and you're going to get more volume produced when you speed things up by using machines. Um, but then if you're interested in creating volume, um, that's going to make your craftsmanship suffer slightly. And, you know, I, I, I think anytime you, you actively put a machine between you and your leather work, you create a disconnect. Uh, I'll still use a hot foil machine instead of, you know, stamping by hand, for example, on this uh, edge preaser with a uh, type holder on the end, which I use sometimes. But, you know, I'll still use a hot foil machine because it gives, you know, the most precision. Uh, and, you know, if it's slightly off, the customer's not gonna appreciate that. Uh, I'll still use a skiving machine, um, which, you know, can save time, give you very accurate skives on long pieces, which can take, you know, a while to skive by hand. That's probably, been, probably my limit, 
and everybody's going to have a different limit and different reasons. Some people uh, who are real purists go, I would never touch a Skyver machine to thin down the edges. I'd only ever Skyve by hand. Um, and I wouldn't disagree with them if that, if that works for them. So everybody has a different philosophy on it, which is what it comes down to, really, um, is, is your philosophy and your beliefs on, on craftsmanship, because that's what matters. If you're doing something that compromises what you believe in, it's generally going to suffer anyway. So somebody might do really well creating laser cut clutches, bags, uh, watch straps, or whatever, all power to them. If, if they're happy with that method, it's working for them, they're happy in their work, they're happy in what they do, their customers are happy, then, you know, that's, that's what they should be doing. Um, so what's my personal opinion on laser cutters? I wouldn't use them. I don't know what it does to the edge burning wise or if that affects them or if you have to sand it afterwards to get rid of the char. I don't know, um, but uh, I probably wouldn't use one. Okay. Okay, there's a conversation going on about burning skin. <laughs> What's that? Mama don't know? Mama don't know. Okay, <laughs> that's a cool name. Sorry, it's so far away, I can't read it. Do you hand cut everything or use die stamping? You know, I, I hand cut everything. I, I, I cut by hand, mainly because I enjoy it. I really do. I love cutting leather. I love the challenge of it because if you get it wrong, you can't, you know, click undo. And it really pushes you to focus. And I love things that really push me to focus because it's almost like mindful meditation sometimes. Like one of the great joys that I have in starting a leather craft project is the initial cutting out phase, taking my patterns, deciding where they're gonna go, you know, weighting everything down, and then just, you know, taking my time because my mind is thinking about nothing else. All your problems, all your concerns, all the stresses go away because you can't think about anything else but cutting. It's like sometimes I like to use a straight razor to clean up the beard because if your mind wanders, you'll have eight pints of blood coming out your neck. So <laughs> some, some things that really force me to laser focus, I love it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do it by hand. Now, if I was to start a business now, uh, my main, the, my previous business is kind of in stasis at the moment. But if I was to start Finch England back up again and start producing again, uh, and I had a certain number of uh, bags or cases or wallets that were doing very well, would I spend half my day cutting out all the components? Uh, probably not. I would actually probably switch to die cutting uh, to speed up the process through necessity. I wouldn't like it because I enjoy that phase, but I would also appreciate that I just can't get enough done uh, unless I do stuff like that, especially if you're hand stitching and doing things like hand skiving and doing a lot of hand work. There are some processes. Or alternatively, I would hire some company in the studio and uh, get somebody to come in and teach them if they didn't already know how to click or how to cut out patterns and use the person as the machine, as long as they were good and I trusted them. Okay, cool. So I'm uh, just gonna mark some of these off to make sure that I don't go over them again. Uh, da, 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 da. What's the best way to apply edge paint? So another edge paint question. What's the best way to apply it? In all, in all honesty, the best way to apply edge paint would be uh, whichever way you're most comfortable with. Now that could be using a scratch all or round all, okay, like that, which is a scratch all. Um, you could, what else do we have here? You could use an edge paint roller, something like this, which has some knurling on the end, so like a grippy feel to it, and it rolls, so it's on bearings. So you could roll your edge paint on. Uh, you can use this, which is a bamboo skewer. Uh, I do this for, for larger edges sometimes, where I can dip a bit more in, so it has a bit more of a reservoir on there. Um, I put a bit of beeswax on there and heat it over a flame, and then wipe the excess off, which makes it non-stick. So I can peel the edge paint off afterwards. Or you can use uh, something like this. This is uh, actually water in there. This is testing for testing heat, but something like these, which have a little tiny spout on the end there, um, almost like a, a syringe. Uh, so you, I can place edge paint down and then draw it along. 
So that's another way of doing it. But which, you know, sometimes I will switch from one to the other depending on the type of edge. If it's a larger edge, then the, this little bamboo skewer or an edge paint bottle so I can put more down, otherwise I'll be there forever. Uh, you know, so I'll switch it around, but it comes down to practicing and uh, finding what works best for you. Simple as that, simple as that. Um, so what's the best way? Whichever way works best for you. So next question. Da, 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 da. Someone asked, has the video frozen? Uh, hasn't, someone else says, hasn't frozen for me, pal. Okay, so I guess that's your Wi-Fi. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, which is better to stitch backwards or forwards? So I've seen this, deba this debate before thinking about it now. I remember there was, uh, I won't say his name, there's a French leather craftsman uh, who's on Instagram uh, and he was uh, arguing with a Russian craftsman who did a video where the Russian craftsman was stitching forwards and he took exception to that and there was this huge argument, that's not the way we do it in France, that's not how it's done, that's not how you should do it. The other guy was saying, well, I get the same results, so what's, what's the problem if I do it differently to the way you do it? Um, which is a good question, right? Uh, and the French leather craftsman, who sure remained nameless, was just saying, no, that's not the way it's done. Blah, blah, blah. But no one was saying, why? why? Why is it better to stitch backwards than it is forwards? And while I wouldn't say it's better, there are two reasons that no one ever seems to talk about or know about but people who advocate stitching backwards just don't seem to know, but they will just defend to the ends of the earth that you must stitch backwards as you, as you go. There's two reasons uh, it's, it's better to stitch backwards. Number one, if you look at left-handed people when they write, now, this isn't my right hand, this is a mirror image for you guys on Instagram, okay? This is actually my left hand. When people write left, they tend to do it so that their hand misses the page, right? Because what they don't want to do is smudge because we write in English from left to right and most languages left to right. So if you're left-handed, your hand tends to smudge your work. Now, if you're stitching, it's a very similar. Say the seam was running top to bottom. As I'm stitching and moving down, as my fingers leave the line of the stitches, the seam up here, I'm not touching them, okay? But if I'm stitching and going up, my fingers are constantly touching the seam that I'm actually stitching, which means that if there's any dirt or grease or anything that you've picked up on your fingers, you are more likely to dirty the stitches because they're just getting a lot more time being touched and being rubbed by skin, your palm of your hand, your fingertips as you're going through. So if you're using you know, white stitching, uh, white thread rather, um, there's a potential to, um, to dirty it because you're, it's covered in wax, which picks up a lot more dirt as well. So that's one reason. The other reason is, um, and it, it's, not, it's not a great reason, but when you're stitching your seam, let's say I start my seam far forward, so I'm stitching a long piece, a bag, for example, that's sitting here on the side of my leg in the clams. I can't bring the end where I start the seam any further forwards because there's bag in the way watch strap or something, it's not, this isn't a big deal. But over here, my arms are at their freshest when I start the seam, okay? My arms are sticking out. As they get tired, my arms come closer to the center line of my body, okay? So as my arms get more tired, the action gets easier as well. Now, if I was to do it the other way around, I start stitching, and my arms and shoulders start getting tired, the further forward I go, it gets exponentially more tiring on my shoulders and my upper back and you know, on my forearms. So another reason to do it is as you get tired, it gets closer to the body and easier at the same time. You know, is that a big deal if you're stitching a wallet? No. So anybody that stitches forwards, do you need to learn how to stitch backwards if you're getting the same results? No. Are you having issues dirtying your thread? No, that's fine. Are you having issues with arms getting tired? No, that's fine. So if you're getting the result, the result is the most important thing. Um, it doesn't matter which way you stitch, but if I was teaching it, and I do obviously in my video courses, I teach stitching furthest away from you and then bringing the stitch. That way you're not touching the thread more than it needs to be touched and your arms are getting more and more relaxed as they come forwards towards you. So is it better to stitch backwards or forwards? 
Personally, uh, for me and what I teach, I feel that it's better to come backwards, but it depends. Mm -hmm. Wish and Leather says, I personally do two back stitches or however many you want, then cut really close to the item, then use a little bit of glue, poking the thread. I guess somebody is answering a question somebody asked. <laughs> cool. Uh, right, next question. Let's move on. How to sharpen a pricking iron. Uh, personally, I like to use a, if, if I'm going to clean up, Say for example, I, I buy myself uh, a pricking iron and I want to clean or smooth the prongs. I'll have a little hobby vise that I keep over in the corner with like a, a rubber jaw on there and I clamp it in and then I can use a very fine file, similar to a saw file, uh, but the sides are completely bare so that it's not filing anything that it, the sides are rubbing against and I can clean it up that way. But here's the thing, I, I don't actually like sharp pricking irons and I, I don't know of anybody else in the crafting community that does this, but if I have a, a pricking iron that's exceptionally sharp, I will literally blunt it on sandpaper. Uh, while a lot of people will be going crazy, I like when a pricking iron kind of pushes the leather in slightly before it cuts and starts severing through the fibers. And the reason is I feel that when the edges of the slit that's being cut are slightly curved, it gives a better looking stitch and it's also easier to stitch. And it's less likely, say when you have a 90 degree cut because it's sharp, that the grain gets pulled out with the needle and with the thread. And sometimes the grain can actually get folded over in the stitch. Uh, that doesn't tend to happen with pricking eyes that are uh, a little bit more blunt. Now there's another craftsman, uh, Martin Carswell, did a, a recent video uh, on his Instagram, Instagram TV. Great video all about pricking irons and he mentioned that it's very, very difficult to rock your pricking iron. You know when you start it where you think it should be started, you rock it back onto the heel of the uh, first prong there and then you lift up and put your front prong in that hole and you can kind of walk it back to see where the stitch is going to finish up, which is a good way of doing it. Uh, if you have a sharp pricking iron, you tend to make little cuts. Uh, so that's another reason. But yeah, I, d I don't tend to like sharp pricking irons uh, very much. Uh, and it can also make, in some leathers, make the slit a little harder to see. But hey, horses for courses, everyone has their different, um, different opinions. And it's it, what, what are you satisfied with? The result that you're going for, are you getting it with the way that you do it? Absolutely fine. So it's just what I found to be true and I, I prefer pricking irons that aren't particularly sharp. Now a lot of people send pricking irons back if they don't cut themselves with it. You know, some people really love that sharp blade on the end there and uh, complain if, if, it's not, if it's not sharp enough to me. No, it's, uh, it's the other way around. Okay, cool. Right, moving on. How to sharpen punches. Yes, that's an interesting one. Um, I'll, get, I'll get a punch here, hold on one second. So how to sharpen punches. Uh, what I like to do is chuck this into a drill press. I uh, know not everybody's gonna have one. Spin it, make sure it spins true, and then just get a diamond plate uh, or a piece of sandpaper on, on a board and then just go over the edge and it will accurately thin down the edges. You don't need punches to be too, too sharp. It doesn't have to be, you know, like scrape your nails off sharp. It just has to be sharp enough. But I would be very, very careful of sharpening the inside too much. You only ever want to remove a burr um, because the inside of a punch actually widens as it goes up. So it's not straight walled, it actually does that. So when you punch a piece of leather, it goes up into a chamber that gradually gets thicker. And that way you can you know, tap them out really easily. If it didn't do that, it would jam up. So I have seen some sharpening systems where there's a cone that you stick up inside the mouth and then you know, sharpen it that way. But that tends to turn this into this. So eventually, if you keep doing that, you're gonna get a, a jam, uh, which is annoying. So you only ever wanna use that just to take off the burr. So the sharpening happens on the outside, a bit like a skiving knife. The, uh, the edge of the blade here, the angle, the words are, coming, are not coming to me right now, the bevel is only on the outside. You only, you mainly sharpen here and you just 
pull back a couple times on the, on the rear because you want this to be super flat. So it's the same on this. You want to sharpen from the outside, not necessarily from the inside. Okay, so uh, second to last question. Gluing on a fold, does the inner have to be thinner and smaller? So uh, what this individual is mentioning is, is if you glue two pieces of leather together uh, and you want to glue it around a form, okay? So when you glue two pieces of leather and they're both curved, they keep that curve. That's, that's gluing uh, on a fold. Does the inside, say the lining material, have to be thinner and smaller? Uh, thinner ideally, because if the outside is thinner um, and it wants to open back up again, it's going to resist the least and it's more likely to crease. So if the outside is thinner than the inside when gluing on a curve, that can sometimes be a problem. So ideally, the same thickness or thinner on the inside, uh, definitely, or um, the exterior should always be slightly stiffer. That's a, a general rule of thumb. Uh, does it have to be smaller? Uh, not necessarily because what you tend to do is glue on a curve and then trim everything up. Um, that can be from your template or it, you could trim up the lining to the exterior leather that you just glued onto. Uh, so you don't have to make it smaller to, to counteract the fact that it will be covering less distance. Uh, so it doesn't have to be smaller, but ideally thinner or softer on the inside, thicker and or firmer on the outside. Okay, and lastly, lastly, thread types, thread types. I know a lot of you on Instagram have been talking about that. Uh, yep, so it's just seeing something there and it's not in my language, so I don't know how to answer that. So thread types, I love tiger, as in tiger thread, rits of tiger thread, um, but I love the look of linen, but it's harder to use. Yeah, it, it, it can be harder to use for, for some things, Linen is a great way to find out if you're good at stitching. If you can stitch well with, with cabled anything really, but cabled linen, if you can stitch well with it, you know your stitching technique is good. With tiger thread, whether your technique is stitching is okay or it's really good, it tends to look the same. It's what I call a very forgiving thread because it's flat. It tends to be uh, lay a bit more consistent. You'll never get that fine look with tiger thread, in my personal opinion. You won't get that finesse. Um, you won't get that necessarily that traditional look that a lot of people like, depending on what you like. Um, but it, it's very forgiving. It allows you to make a few mistakes and it won't make you pay for it. If you change the order that you do things during a stitch or if your stitching technique is not spot on, if you want to have nice consistent angles and a very consistent seam. Uh, cabled linen especially is going to expose you very quickly and you'll get to see where you're doing things wrong, which can be good because if your mistakes are highlighted very clearly, you know to do something about them, uh, which is good. Now, if you find linen difficult, it just means you need a little bit more practice. Um, but if you like tiger thread, and in anticipation of this, uh, I got these out. Now these are from Rocky Mountain Leather Supply. Um, they sent me a sample of these. It's, it's not my kind of thread. It's a little bit shiny. It's, it's what you call poly braid. Some people like it, some people don't. What it is, is braided polyester like tiger thread, waxed, but it is produced in a way that's a bit more rounded. So it doesn't lay as flat. Uh, it looks, in my opinion, better than tiger thread when stitched. It doesn't look that dissimilar to regular cabled polyester or some um, linen threads. So it's a bit of a compromise, but if you like tiger thread and you're not that keen on the way linen looks or the way it stitches or you're having trouble with it, uh, give poly braid a try. It's just a rounded braided polyester, uh, which might work a little bit better for you. I don't know why it's, it took so long to come out with, with this, because it does seem uh, an obvious uh, answer to that, doesn't it, really? Okay, so... Oh, he is saying, nice job. <laughs> Excellent. All right, guys. Well, is there any more questions you guys have on the live before I sign out? There is a few minutes left, but not too much longer. <laughs> cool. 
All right. PNW EDC says, Tiger's nice when you roll or hammer it afterwards. Yeah, most threads are gonna, are gonna look a little bit more neater, a little bit more consistent when you, uh, when you tap them down. It, it really depends on what, on what you like. I don't like it. I don't like the look of it, never have. Uh, but on some projects, especially like outdoor projects, like uh, knife sheaths, um, pouches, things like that, where you need a little bit more toughness and it's not so much about having that traditional fine leather craft look, then it, it actually works quite well. Uh, or you're doing a stitch that's straight or below the surface of the leather. I don't think it looks too bad. Um, it's, just, uh, it's just my snobbery. Simple as that. There's no, there's no logical reason. But then again, I didn't start Leathercraft for logical reasons. We start it because it's something that we love to do and something that we believe in and, and makes us uh, uh, makes us feel good, you know. And that, you know, a lot of things we do are completely illogical and liking one type of thread over another when it's all it's doing is holding pieces of leather together. It's really illogical when you think about it. But uh, this isn't based in logic. How do you finish with linen thread? Uh, uh, it's not here. Okay, all right. Uh, usually, I have a little bit, uh, I have one of these with PVA glue in, and I'll just do a dab on the rear side uh, after pushing the thread in. So I'll snip the thread close to the surface, push it in, dab of white glue, and then tap everything down. So after you've added your glue, tap everything down and that closes the leather around it. it. Actually provides a really, really strong bond. Even after like five minutes, like a couple of times I've had to redo a seam for whatever reason, I need to take it apart again. And even after a few minutes of just that little tiny touch of glue and then closing the leather, when it comes to like taking it out, it's almost like you're trying to break the thread again to get it out. So it's actually a very, very tough way of finishing uh, thread, but it's always done after two or three back stitches as well. Will you save the live to Instagram TV? Uh, yes, yes I will be, sorry, yeah. Uh, someone's saying, I can't read their name because it's gone up too far. The handbag course, when will it be finished? Very, very shortly. Uh, the next one is the, is the finale, which is inserting the gussets, inserting the zip flap, how to stitch the outside and the inside consistently so they both look like the external seam. Uh, it's also gonna be finishing the zip gusset, which is the opening and the closing of the bag itself. And also finishing the edges, uh, which is not going to be burnished, it's not going to be edge painted, and it's not going to be a turned edge. It is what I'm calling a stabilized and polished edge. So it's a new concept for edge finishing that I want to introduce to the world, um, which comes from a very, very old book where they use a different substance to stabilize the edge rather than burnish, rather than just use edge paint. So there is something holding it together, but it's inside the leather rather than on top of, but it looks like a burnish, but it's more consistent and it's more durable than a burnish. So that's something that's new, and that is the Terrain Luxury Handbag. Uh, so it gives it a beautiful finish, traditional, traditional look, but it's a brand new concept for edge finishing so it's no longer just gonna be burnish, edge paint, or turned edge. This is my idea of the fourth dimension of edge finishing, so stay tuned for that. But yeah, the next one, the next course that's coming out is the finale, and then it's gonna be a brand new course after that. Uh, so stay tuned for what that's going to be. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Razier, sorry, I can't see, I can barely see. Uh, says, you are so professional that I can ask questions. I just listen and try to pick the notes can be used in my first steps of leather crafting. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. You're very well, uh, very welcome. Uh, thank you for saying that. Uh, Wishton Leather says, when I start my waitress job, I'm going to buy your course because the bag is so damn sexy. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> And Waitrose, for all you who don't know, is like the poshest UK uh, supermarket uh, where they do really good coffee as well. It's like the best of everything there. I love it. Uh, thank you, Philip, for the video. You're absolutely uh, more than welcome. Uh, Slabicon says, thanks for the info. Phil, it was very helpful. No problem at all. And just in closing, apologies to all the people on the Instagram Live who's had questions that I didn't see. Obviously, I had to get through quite a bit of material. 
Um, so it's not like a regular live where it's just you and me talking, but this is gonna be available afterwards on Instagram TV. And it's also going to be on YouTube. And I'm also gonna take the audio from this, if it's good, and then put it up as a podcast. But thanks for watching guys. I uh, appreciate everyone who asked questions. Thank you to all of you who put questions on Instagram stories um, that uh, you know I might not have been able to. There's like 120 something questions. Uh, I couldn't put all of them up on stories because uh, it wouldn't let me. And also I, I couldn't discuss all of them. So it was just the ones that kept repeating. Those are the ones that I focused on today. I hope you found it helpful. If you want more information on how to work leather, how to get started in leather, how to do beginner, media, and advanced projects, head to leathercraftmasterclass.com, take a look at the courses and see if there's something that you would like to do in those projects as well. So again, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.